Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I am Michael Morella, Managing Editor of Events at US News and World Report. And thanks so much for joining us for our webinar today. Um, today's session is part of our Healthcare of Tomorrow virtual event series. Um, this is the latest evolution of our annual Healthcare of Tomorrow conference, which we've hosted annually since 2013. We're going to be exploring some of the key issues of importance to hospital and healthcare leaders across the country, including sessions on the future of cancer care, uh, the U.S. News hospital rankings, and lessons learned from the COVID-19 front lines. Um, I encourage you to explore our full list of programs at usnews.com slash healthcare of tomorrow. So we have a timely session ahead today and a lot that we wanna cover uh, in just a, a short amount of time. But before we do a few quick notes, um, we are capturing video of today's session and we will be making that available to registrants after we finish up here. Um, we are also streaming today's program on the US News Facebook page. Um, audience members, if you have questions, you can please type them into the Q&A feature on Zoom on your screen. Our team will review those and try to cover um, what we can during the course of the session. So now I am honored to introduce Dr. Peter Hotez, professor and director of the Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's Hospital and Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Hotez is an internationally recognized physician scientist in vaccine development and neglected tropical diseases. He's authored hundreds of scientific papers and several books. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's of course, a frequent commentator in the media about sharing truth about science. I encourage you if you haven't to read our profile of Dr. Hotez that US News published in June as part of our Hospital Heroes series. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Peter Hotez. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Thrilled to be here. And I want to turn it over to our moderator for today's discussion, and that is Kim Castro, Editor and Chief Content Officer of U.S. News and World Report. Over to you, Kim. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, Dr. Hotez. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good to see you, Kim. All happy to be here. Great. We've got 30 minutes and a lot to cover, so I want to first start off by asking you, what's this past year been like for you? You've been involved in combating other major infectious disease outbreaks. How is this one different? I think this one is different is because it's had such a massive impact on the U.S. population. You know, most of my life has been devoted to what some people call what we a term we help coin the neglected tropical diseases, the diseases of poverty uh, affecting mostly people in low income countries of Africa, Asia, Latin America. And we've been developing vaccines for these diseases for years and designing packages of medicines. And it's always been a struggle to get people uh, in places like the US to understand the widespread impact of these diseases, how they not only uh, uh, affect global health, but also poverty. They also trap populations in poverty and cause uh, um, affect global security. And then it really struck home in the United States in a big way. And the fact that we, as part of our program, we had actually adopted a coronavirus program a decade ago, a coronavirus vaccine program with a group at the New York Blood Center. And so we had been working on coronavirus vaccines for the last decade with, at a time when people didn't really care much about them. So we were able to hit the ground running uh, developing vaccines. And the other piece is I uh, like to do public engagement and science communication. I'm a MD, PhD laboratory investigator scientist, but I also have had a foot implanted in the in public engagement over the years. And that given my past, uh, uh, track record of working on coronaviruses and coronavirus vaccines put me sort of front and center in, in all of this in terms of being out there on the cable news networks and other forms of media. So it's been a very intense year combining trying to accelerate our vaccine uh, and we made an announcement today which we can talk about and at the same time talking to the nation and 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 to count and then lately countering some awful disinformation coming out of components of the White House, which has been very stressful. So I have to say, it's probably been about the most intense year of my life I've ever had. Like all of us, we all work hard. And I think it's the, not just the amount of hours, but the, in waking up early, going to bed late, I've always done that. It's the level of intensity is just 
beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Well, speaking to that intensity, every day we are seeing the grim statistics of record-breaking daily number of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and even deaths. Just yesterday, the U.S. surpassed 11 million COVID cases, one million more in less than a week. How do you characterize where we are today? Well, unfortunately, um, as the worst may still be yet to come. Uh, we we're looking now at with some of the projections from the Institute for Health Metrics looks at maybe 400,000 Americans who will have perished from COVID-19 by early February. Uh, so that means we're still looking at another 150,000 Americans who will die and, and needlessly lose their lives uh, over the next few weeks. So this as awful as that's been and exhausting as it's been, we're now entering the worst phase of all when the numbers are really accelerating, especially across the middle part of the country in the upper Midwest and, and here in Texas uh, where, where I live and work. And so for me, it's the emphasis now is doing everything we can to, to save lives. Uh, and, and, and there's a certain urgency to it. And I've been getting very emotional on, uh, on, on TV lately because uh, I feel it's so important. Uh, you know, the good news is we got more news today that vaccines are coming. Good vaccines will be coming in the spring. And so in the past, when I've pleaded with Americans to socially distance and wear masks and all the things that we talk about, I was never able to uh, put an end to it. You know, it, it was always essentially asking the American people to do that in perpetuity. Now we have a bracket. We have a right-hand bracket to all of this, which says, uh, look, if we can just keep it together for a few more months, uh, we will have good uh, vaccines. Maybe ours will, will be one of them as well. But the point is we have proof of concept now that the vaccines work and we'll be vaccinating the American people so that by the summer, maybe late in, late in May, we'll be in a much, much better position than we are now. And where you can go about your day feeling comfortable that you're not going to wind up that night in, in an intensive care unit uh, with, with, with COVID-19. And that's incredibly powerful. But a lot of people still aren't getting the message. And so the, the, the plea now is uh, just hang on a few more months. We're not asking you to do this in perpetuity. Do everything you can to save the life of your father, your mother, your brother or sister, and be responsible, socially distance, uh, uh, wear face masks, and don't tie defiance of this to the political allegiance. It's all about saving lives. I mean, because the projections are 150,000 more Americans will lose their lives in the coming weeks, and, and, and every one is preventable. And I really mean that. So to me, that's, that's, that's the big message for, for today, Kim. So some state leaders have recalibrated and they've instituted mask mandates. They reduced customer capacity within certain businesses and even lockdowns and there, there will be more lockdowns on the way. Are we better prepared as the general public this time around? I, I think so. You know, the problem has been all year we've not had a coordinated federal response. Um, the, the response is all about letting the states in the lead and the U.S. government uh, will provide backup support for manufacturing and supply chain management and PPE and, 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 and that sort of thing. And, and it, it was a failed strategy. We needed a well-crafted coordinated federal plan with directives to the states, preferably led by the Centers for Disease Control to depoliticize it, that identified every state what they needed to do to save lives. And we just didn't have that. It was, uh, instead it was highly decentralized, left to the states. And the problem with it is the states never had the epidemiologic horsepower and understood the models and the predictive models about what they needed to do to keep their population safe. And the other problem was they, the governors were buffeted by all of these political forces and they needed to be able to say to their, uh, to their ob objectors uh, or the people that were going against them, look, I hear what you're saying, but the CDC is telling me if we don't do X, Y, and Z, this many Floridians or Georgians or Texans or Oklahomans are going to perish. Uh, and that conversation never took place because there was never 
that sort of federal leadership to to to, to bring bring that home and and as a result we lost so many lives and now of course in our lame duck session it's it's worse than ever and again the states are kind of left to figure it out and and the political forces especially in some of the some of the red states are very powerful and you know objecting they're under this fake banner that they call health freedom or medical freedom you're still seeing that widespread defiance and and the plea that I'm doing and I'm speaking to everyone I can is to, this is not a time for this. Uh, just save, save your life and your family member's life. We're not asking you to, to do this forever. It's just a short period of time. I mean, think how terrible you'll feel as if you, if you lose a, a mother or father or brother or sister over the next few weeks knowing that all we needed to do is get them to the other side to get them vaccinated, then they'll have a normal lifespan. And, and uh, it's a tough message to get through, but I think it's a really urgent one we need to put out there. Yeah, it's a small sacrifice that we can all make for sure. And well, it's sad, right? I mean, I mean, look, I, you know, my, my oldest daughter, uh, Emmy, is a research scientist at UCLA we were going to have her come visit for Thanksgiving or, you know, or shortly before and with her husband and she was going to drive from Los Angeles to Texas and which meant staying overnight in New Mexico or El Paso area, which is one of the worst affected areas in the country. And, you know, I had to call her and say, don't come. It's, it's not worth you getting sick and it's not worth you getting us sick. Um, we'll, we'll do this another time. And it, it was sad. Like, you know, to say it's heartbreaking, you know, given how many people are, are dying in, in ICUs right now, it, it's not fair to say, but you know, it, there is a sadness there. And I think more and more conversations are gonna have to happen like this now across the country. Uh, and to say, this is not the year to have a big Thanksgiving celebration or a, or a Christmas celebration. There'll be many Christmases and Thanksgivings to come if we can just get everyone through the other side. That is the exact message I shared with my father um, the other day. So uh, from what you've seen so far, are you optimistic that President-elect Joe Biden and his administration can actually turn things around? What are your thoughts on what they ac can accomplish, especially during the first few months? Well, the, the good news is that they, you know, hopefully will have access to vaccines and that that's going to be a game changing technology. You know, the hard part is going to be still making Americans understand that the vaccines are, are not perfect as good as they are. And that even if you're vaccinated, you may still, after you're exposed to virus, may still shed virus in your, from your nose or your mouth or your upper airway. So there still could be a lot of virus circulating even after vaccines come out. So we're still going to need masks and social distancing to some extent, and that's gonna be a tough message. I think the, the other challenge is COVID-19 has been so politicized, heavily politicized. And I think this would be a good opportunity to take the leadership of the response. First of all, implement a national leadership, which it seems that the Biden administration is committed to, which I think is great. And I actually have an article coming out maybe today or tomorrow recommending that the federal response take it out of Washington, just take it out of Washington. Everything's too politicized. Move it to Atlanta where it belongs and let it be run by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. They're the ones who should know how to do this. Um, after all, the U.S. taxpayers paying $11 billion a year for it. Uh, let's, let's do this. And I think that will make uh, a big difference. The other challenge that the Biden administration is going to have is right now, I mean, eventually this virus is gonna be all over the nation by, by the time we get to January. For now, it's almost entirely in the midsection of the country. And that basically means mostly red states. So how, how does the Biden administration manage that, uh, thread that needle at, at uh, convincing uh, the leaders, not only the governors, but local leaders uh, in, in red states up and down the middle part of the country, including here in Texas, uh, to take this on. And so I think he's, it's going to be very important for the president, for President-elect Biden, to cultivate Republican champions. And I think that's that's got to be a priority. We're going to have to figure out a way to bridge this horrible divide that's tearing our country apart and, and bring people together over this. 
So to balance that bleak news with the positive, let's dig into your specialty, which is vaccines. What was your reaction to Moderna's announcement today that its COVID vaccine is 94% effective and Pfizer's similar announcement from last week? Is it really time to break out the champagne? And why does Moderna have an edge over Pfizer? Well, you know, one of the things I like to point out is all we know is our two company press releases. And all the information in the press releases is good news, but I always point out when a company sends out a press release, they're not talking to you, Kim, they're not talking to me, they're talking to their shareholders. And, and that's what we have to remember. Um, and that's been a problem with the communications out of Operation Warp Speed. It's been, uh, they've, there's never been a communication strategy. I think it's been a great program in terms of scientific rigor and integrity of clinical trials. But uh, in terms of communication, that all, everything's been ceded to the pharma CEOs and more often than not, the pharma CEOs have fumbled on, on the message and created a lot of instability and we can, we can talk about why. So one of the things I wanna see of course is the actual data uh, and so that the scientific community can review the data. The scientific community has not seen it. Again, it's just a company press release. I think it'll likely hold up in which case that's really exciting news. And the hope is that the data is there where the both companies will request emergency use authorization so the FDA can start releasing vaccines to the public uh, you know, by the early part of next year. And remember, other, other companies are coming along, other vaccines are coming along. There's gonna be, there could be up to eight or nine vaccines in operational warp speed. And then we're also accelerating a vaccine. We made a big announcement today for India that we're developing a different type of vaccine, hopefully as effective, but it's a low cost recombinant protein vaccine that uses an older technology. It's been around for 40 years to make the recombinant, uh, the similar technology that's used to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine uh, all over the world. And now our partners, Biological E and Hyderabad India are making 1.2 billion doses. So we're hoping we can make a contribution there. So there's, it's a very complex vaccine ecosystem and the first two out of the starting gate in the US program, Operation Warp Speed, are looking really promising. They have some logistical challenges in that they require frozen storage. And we haven't had a lot of vaccines before that have required uh, frozen storage. Uh, so that makes it a little more complicated to, uh, for adults to get this vaccine like they would their usual adult vaccines, which is go to your local pharmacy or, or supermarket. The, the Moderna vaccine may have somewhat of an advantage because it's, they report that it seems to be stable in, in the refrigerator, uh, two to eight degrees centigrade for, uh, for an entire month. So you can envision therefore that a shipment of the vaccine could go to a place where adults typically get vaccinated. In the case of the Pfizer vaccine, it seems to need a deeper, deeper freeze, minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit and is stable at refrigerator temperatures for only 24 hours. So there's gonna be more logistical challenges. But the, again, the leadership of Operation Warp Speed anticipated this. They brought in this amazing, I think he's a four-star general, Gus Perna, uh, who's had a lot of experience with supply chain management and logistics. He's a pro at this. And remember the US government, this is not totally foreign to the US government. We, we, we do this incredible dance every fall of giving out 100 million doses of influenza vaccine. So we know how to do things at scale. So I think it's definitely doable. There are gonna be a few more challenges with these first two vaccines because of the freezer requirement. And then other vaccines hopefully will be coming along. But the bottom line is good vaccines are, are coming. You know, the other question I get asked him a lot is uh, almost every time there's a Q&A, they say, hey, Dr. Hotez, which vaccine are you waiting for? And uh, I have a very specific answer there. I say, look, I'm, I'm not waiting for any one vaccine. They all work by inducing high levels of what are called virus neutralizing antibodies. That's what protects you from going into the intensive care unit or hospital. That's how our vaccine works. That's how the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine works. And the fact that they've been shown to work is validates that what we've been doing, all the vaccine developers are doing. So that's great, but the, um, but then I say, uh, look, we may not, and especially in the early days, we may not have a lot of choice in terms of which vaccine we get and don't wait for the perfect vaccine. Get what you can because the, every day you walk around without virus neutralizing antibodies, 
in your system is a day where you could get COVID and get very sick. So what I've been saying for myself and for my family, I will take any of the Operation Warp Speed vaccines that are authorized by the FDA and made available to me. Even if it turns out that that particular vaccine uh, doesn't turn out to be the best vaccine, it's still better having virus neutralizing antibodies in, in my system at this terrible time than not. And if later on it's shown that it's not the best vaccine, better ones come along, you know what? I could get a boost with that later on. But don't hold out waiting for, uh, you know, waiting for something you think might be better. As I often say, don't let the, uh, um, the perfect be the enemy of, of the good. Um, and I think that very much applies here. Get what you can, get virus neutralizing antibodies in your system, and it, it will save your life. Great. So, so what does a rollout look like? When will majority of the, the general public receive the vaccine? Well, the hope, um, I think Dr. Fauci said Q2. Um, it keeps shifting around Q1, Q2, but you know, sometime by the spring, hopefully we'll have a significant percentage of the US population uh, vaccinated. I think Moderna is committed to supplying 100 million doses. I think Pfizer already has 50 million doses, but I think only half that's for the US. And remember, you have to cut it in two because it's two doses required. So right now, I think Pfizer says they'll have, they'll be able to vaccinate around 12 million Americans by the end of the year. So the numbers are slowly getting up there and we don't have approval for pediatric use at this time. So we're mainly talking about um, maybe teenagers and adults. Um, the good news also for the Moderna vaccine, they reported in their press release some information that it protected older Americans uh, as well. We don't, we don't see that in the Pfizer press release. The hope is that it does as well. And that's gonna be important because we know that's a vulnerable population. So throughout the pandemic, you and your fellow scientists have been facing a raging anti-science movement. Um, that's, that began more than 20 years ago, but has since gained a stronger foothold not just in the States, but globally. How is this undermining the work to combat COVID-19? Yeah, no, this has become a huge problem and, and it really, the anti-vaccine movement really accelerated around 2015 and, and started marching under this banner that they call health freedom or medical freedom. That's a government can't tell us what to do. And it was really strong here in Texas and Oklahoma. And then it took, a and then it became a then national organizations, anti-vaccine organizations started to form like Children's Health Defense led by Robert F. Kennedy. And, and I'm more aware of this than most because I'm, I'm, an, I'm a lead target for these anti-vaccine forces because um, I have a daughter with autism and uh, I wrote a book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism to debunk all of the fake assertions coming out of the anti-vaccine lobby. And, as a consequence, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on his Instagram site has uh, publicly named me the OG villain. I, I had to look it up. It means the original gangster villain. So Kim, you're speaking to the original gangster villains that are going up against the anti-vaccine lobby. And, and it's taken a lot of ominous twists and turns. So in 2020, under that banner of health freedom, medical freedom, they now campaign against masks and contact tracing and social distancing uh, so it's become now a full, they've glommed on basically COVID-19 prevention measures. So it's not only anti-vaccine, it's anti-science. And then what we saw in, in the summer, uh, these, some of these same people went out to Germany um, to rallies in Berlin uh, and CBS News and other news outlets reported that uh, these anti-mask, anti social distancing anti-vaccine marches were sponsored by QAnon and even neo-Nazi groups. So it's taken this kind of weird uh, twisted turn uh, and also in England and Paris. And then as if that weren't enough, you have the Russian government specifically uh, targeting the internet with fake anti-vaccine and disinformation messages. So there's even a term for it now, it's called we weaponized health communication. And this is being led by Russia. So it's, and you know, as I hear myself talk about it, you know, you start, you, I said, my God, I must sound like a crazy person, right? I mean, here I'm talking about um, neo Nazis and Russians and Q 
QAnon, and it sounds like the sort of paranoid ramp, but you know, there's a lot of evidence backing it up. So I'm, I'm very concerned for the nation of how we're gonna kind of dismantle this anti-science empire. I think it's become very dangerous. And we've and we now know that it's led to thousands of American lives lost this year. Yeah, I have definitely seen you trolled on Twitter. So yeah. um, you're clearly an effective communicator. You're extremely prolific. You do numerous media appearances a day. You're featured in podcasts. You're active on social media. How can we get physicians to effectively communicate the importance of vaccines in the exam room? Yeah, I think this is really important. Um, and, and part of the problem is you know, physicians and scientists don't get much in the way of public engagement and science communication training in their education. And that's a nice way of saying none, right? And we, as, as medical students, as residents, as fellows, or as getting your PhD or postdoc, this is just not something that's in the DNA of our training. And, and I think we have to fix that. We need to train a whole cadre of of doctoral level individuals in public health, you know, DR, the DRPH programs and MD programs, PhD programs, how to do that public engagement. When I talk to young people about it, they're all in, they love it, but it's just not in the DNA of, of our education. You know, when I was getting my MD and PhD in New York in the 80s, the message was you don't engage the public, you don't talk to journalists, that was seen as a form of self-promotion or, or grandstanding. And, and all those ideas were created before something called the internet came along and social media. And now I think we've got to scramble to, to fix that because there's a gap, there's a vacuum. And the gap is being filled by anti-vaccine information. And, and this is why, you know, this whole disinformation campaign about COVID-19 that came out of the White House and Scott Atlas saying that uh, um, uh, downplaying the severity of the epidemic or attributing COVID deaths to other causes or these fake concepts of herd immunity or discrediting masks, that was allowed to dominate uh, media communications with devastating effects. And so I think we have to learn from that that we need to fill this gap now with you know, trained scientists and physicians and public health experts who are good at public communication and, and are out there. I mean, if there's any silver lining right now uh, with this COVID epidemic, and there are not many, I, I do think the US, the American people kind of got used to hearing from physicians and scientists on TV and in podcasts more than in the past. And, and I think the American people liked it. They realized that for the most part, it was more reliable than what uh, a lot of the elected leaders were saying, a lot of the politicians, and began to trust it all. So I think there may be a little uh, 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 time of opportunity for us to, to really build that out more. Yeah, we, we do need physicians to inspire behavior change in a chaotic climate like this. So finally, before we take one or two audience questions, you have a new book coming out called Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And in it, you observe that a storm of socio-political and environmental forces have caused an abrupt rise in infectious diseases. Tell us about this concept of vaccine diplomacy that started in the Cold War and how can it help us now in this COVID era? Yeah, it talks about my time as Kim is that when I was uh, served as U.S. science envoy uh, for two years in the Obama administration with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and um, and the State Department, I loved it, and I was asked to help build uh, vaccine development cooperation between the U.S. and countries in the Middle East and North Africa. And it's a concept I've named vaccine diplomacy. It's a goes back to when Albert Sabin developed the oral polio vaccine. Not many people realize he did it jointly with the Soviets at the height of the Cold War, the, right after the Sputnik launch. The two countries put aside their ideology. Sabin brought his oral polio strains to the USSR and that's where it was scaled and made into a vaccine that was tested on 10, 20 uh, Soviet school children, shown to be safe and effective. So it shows you how two countries could put aside their ideologies to work together and looks at that uh, to say, well, how, how can this be made relevant today? Well, certainly it's 
the urgency for this is certainly true for COVID-19 vaccines, where unfortunately we've tried to go in the opposite direction because now we talk about the Russian vaccine or the Chinese vaccine or the British vaccine. There's even a term appended to it called vaccinationalism, which is taking us uh, in, in the wrong direction. And then the other thing the book does is it highlights, it, it, I started writing it way before COVID-19. And, and you know it says that with all the successes that we've had through the Gavi Alliance and the Gates Foundation and WHO, we started having a slowing of those gains in certain hotspot areas due to things that we ordinarily don't think about as physicians and scientists. There were things like war and political collapse and climate change and anti-science forces and urbanization. And I point out how they combine in interesting ways to bring back disease. So the point, a point of the book is COVID-19 was not totally different from what was already happening. It was kind of a culminating event for something that had been underway since about 2015 when the anti-science movements really started to become ascendant. And then we had all of these social forces and determinants. I mean, one of the other side pieces to this is the fact, again, beyond not getting science and uh, public engagement communication training. I mean, when was the last time as a medical student or a PhD in the biomedical sciences, you heard a lecture about climate change or, you know, climate change is starting to permeate the curriculum, but certainly not war and, and political collapse, uh, anti-science, anti-vaccine movements, urbanization. But I think for our physicians, young physicians and scientists and public health experts, we have to start thinking more broadly and really begin addressing some of these things. And the book makes a plea for that. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanna be respectful of your time. I'm sure you have other media appearances lined up. So uh, we will take one audience question and, and here's a good one. What's one thing that anyone listening can do to help and support frontline COVID responders, nurses, doctors, first responders? Well, the one thing we want to do right now is prevent those surges on the ICUs because that's when things break down. I mean, the nurses and the, the techs and the, the physicians, uh, they're, they're all heroes, right? And they're exhausted. They're exhausted donning and doffing PPE and working incredible hours. And when that starts to happen in unrelenting form, that's when the death rates go up. We saw that in New York in March and April. We saw it in Southern Europe and Italy and Spain and uh, uh, earlier in the year. Now we're starting to see this in places like North and South Dakota, which have the highest rates in the country or El Paso, Texas, which is the worst affected city. So the best thing you can do for healthcare providers is to prevent that big surge on the ICUs, to lower mortality and give our, our healthcare heroes, the give them a little breather so they're not so exhausted all the time. And, and that means practicing social distancing, be mindful of who you're seeing, wear masks at all times. Uh, and, and just remember the message is now we have the good news. You don't have to do this in perpetuity. There's brackets on it. There is a time when vaccines will become available. Do everything you can to save the lives of, of your loved ones now over the next few weeks. There's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you for taking time to speak with us today, Dr. Hotez, and for your sustained drive to keep speaking out on behalf of science and facts. It's one of the reasons why you're our uh, featured in our US News uh, Hospital Heroes series. We really appreciate your insights. Well, thank you, Kim. You know, these kinds of things that you're doing, they're so important uh, because uh, they, they really, first of all, it gives a face to the docs and the scientists, which is really important, uh, humanizes us, but at the same time, conveys vital healthcare information and uh, science communication. And this is what it's all about. So you're performing an incredibly important function today and, and have been. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, I encourage our audience to go to usnews.com slash health for more up-to-date advice, information, tools, our Hospital Hero series and our best hospitals rankings. On behalf of US News, thank you for your time. We hope you found this helpful and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you.